Greg, in the conclusion uh, to your book, Reforming the Monastery, Protestant Theologies of the Religious Life, you write, for many in the evangelical world, monasticism, if it's considered at all, is perceived as a relic from the past, a retreat from the world, or a shrinking from the call to the Great Commission. Um, let me play a little devil's advocate. Uh, you've, you've written a whole book, I take it, arguing that that's not the case. Yes. Um, make the case to me. Uh, well, um, I guess it's, it's, it's an example of uh, mislabeling something. So it would be saying, hey, now that the Reformation has settled down, now that uh, new churches, if you will, have come into existence, Lutherans, Anglicans, uh, Reformed churches in France and elsewhere, uh, there's uh, a tendency to just bifurcate and say there's practices that we're going to associate with the Reformation churches mm -hmm. and there's practices that we're just going to label um, Roman Catholic and because of that we're just going to shelve them. We're going to you know, kind of throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater and shelve them. And b because of that really strong dichotomy, uh, which was uh, antagonistic, which was um, motivated you know, simply just not to be this other thing, Monasticism got, uh, got, got thrown out with it. And I think what happened over the, the centuries is that once it had been not just kind of thrown out, because I wouldn't even argue that there was a necessarily a cohesively coherent plan of how to throw it out, if you will, or to set it aside. Uh, I think by destroying the monasteries themselves, the institutions by and large, that it was um, forgotten. Uh, now, of course, Luther and Calvin, as I argue in the book, did in fact have theological reasons for getting rid of monasticism. But once those had been made and once the institution died out, uh, it, it was easily forgotten. And so in, in time, even though it was, you know, well, we, we're not gonna have that because it's Roman Catholic, I think in time it wasn't even expressed like that anymore. It was just mm -hmm. forgotten. Mm -hmm. And it, as evangelicalism, um, I guess, uh, came to the fore or as it developed, depending on how you think of those things, uh, evangelicalism didn't have a uh, it didn't have a, a history to f to look back to, or at least its history, its historical vision was truncated. So it it didn't tell the story of monasticism, and it certainly didn't have institutions. I mean, it may have institutions literally nearby, but you didn't go into those institutions. Mm -hmm. So I think evangelicalism it, it wasn't intentional per se to to kind of. Um, not talk about monasticism or not have the institutions, but in time, uh, the institutions themselves, because they had disappeared, because they had often been labeled just Roman Catholic things, uh, they just got ignored. And so evangelicalism, as it grew historically into the modern period of 21st century, or 20th and 21st century, again, I don't think there was a lot of people taking up their pen and saying, it's time to keep writing against monasticism. It was just something that wasn't thought of anymore. It was out of the picture. Uh, and so, uh, but yet that, again, that the polemics of needing to be anti-Roman Catholic had, had died down, of course, over the centuries. Uh, and what really just came to take its place was more of a, a vision of uh, Christianity and living out the gospel in a family context, primarily. Uh, so you get more works that, that talk about uh, the family and, and, and devotion within family life. And of course, that's, that's taking something for granted, which is, is that everyone marries mm -hmm. uh, and enters into uh, family relationships. Uh, and there w wasn't a theology of vocation to singleness. So that's, that's not monasticism. Just because you're single doesn't mean you're a monk or a nun. But uh, when you've replaced it so strongly with a vision of family life, there's just not no one's talking about monasticism. It's, it's out of sight, it's out of mind in many ways. It's historically, it's, it's this thing that happened that had been set aside, that had polemical reasons for setting it aside, some theological underpinnings for setting it aside. And the focus instead became this other institution of the family. Mm -hmm. So I think just the evangelical church just uh, lost a vision for it, even though no one continued to theologize about why this shouldn't be in the evangelical church. Mm -hmm. um, and what I show in the book is in fact, it, it was gone but not forgotten. Mm -hmm. Uh, its, its advocates um, were there, they just weren't uh, the most vocal or the most, the most read of the advocates. Uh, Bonhoeffer m would be an exception, uh, Bart perhaps an exception, um, but mostly, again, I think it's just a, an issue of, evangelicals just haven't, haven't talked about it, they haven't seen the need for it, historical reasons, maybe some more pragmatic reasons, and. Um, yeah, can, I, can I follow yeah. up on the, on the need? It strikes me um, that there might, might be two ideas here. One is that, even from what you're saying, that, that there might be even a demographic 
reason that all of a sudden there's, a, there's an openness among Protestants to something like monasticism. Mm. So uh, if people are not um, mm, sort of in mass moving into nuclear families in their early 20s, all of a sudden there's a need for a theology of singleness and, a, and a, the question of the, the vocation that's in sure. place there. So there's, you might speak to that. The, the second thing I want to uh, talk about is the role of monasticism in, in, uh, in renewal movements. And I think mm. they're about uh, Donald Blesch, um, I know he's been really influential for you, right, an yeah. evangelical um, in a mainline denomination that was uh, sort of doctrinally sort of going off the tracks. Exactly. Um, and, and I wonder about monasticism and renewal there. Um, mm -hmm. I guess those are two really different subjects. but Yeah, they are really different. And uh, I'm definitely not an expert on 20th century uh, church historical movements, but uh, it was, of course, the 20th century. I mean, 1960s, you know, Kennedy, a Roman Catholic president, who would have thought? Mm. Uh, and so what happens is, is after the war, you have lots of soldiers coming home. It's, you know, many of them had left their kind of sweethearts at home, came back to marry or came back to marry. And uh, you get the growth of suburbia and those kinds of things, planned communities. And so family is, is really there. The 70s, of course, come along and introduce, you know, the countercultural move of like, well, what does it look like to live in communities but not be families per se, or at least institutionally, we, we don't marry and those kinds of things. And, and perhaps that, that movement put something like communal living uh, came back into the fore, intentional community living, um, Koinonia Farm and those places grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And I think what happens is you, it, it forces the evangelical church, largely influenced in America by the Jesus movement, so it has a lot of these individuals mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. are now saying, well, I, I'm not going to marry or I'm, I haven't married or God is calling me to singleness. And so that, that reintroduces a discussion about a vocation of singleness. And I think it's, it was only a matter of time before monasticism was gonna be kind of co-opted back into that discussion. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is almost, I think, historical circumstances, not uniquely, mm -hmm. but mostly driven, I think, by North American historical circumstances, uh, maybe why monasticism is more interesting to talk about. Again, the Roman Catholic uh, president in Kennedy, just it, it makes Roman Catholicism less less foreign, I think, to a lot of people. I mean, I, I'm from the middle of Virginia, central Virginia, so we didn't have enclaves of Irish Roman Catholics or Polish Roman Catholics, you know, just living in the middle of Virginia there. Roman Catholicism wasn't a big factor at all. But what happens with Kennedy and, and all, it brings Roman Catholicism into mainstream, if you will. It's, it's, it's seen as less maybe immigrant mm -hmm. related and more of what part of America is, this large swath of Roman Catholics that, that have settled in the United States. So that familiarity, greater familiarity with Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. uh, Vatican II changing things up even in Roman Catholicism and probably making the church more accessible, the Roman Catholic church more accessible to a broad number of people. And then this rise of just talk about singleness and, and intentional community living. Uh, so I think that's a large part of why, uh, you know, here we are in the early 21st century talking about monasticism more and more, uh, those historical movements. Uh, and, and even that is, uh, I mean, I think that alone is suggestive, and I think it could move evangelicals a long way. Just, just the image of these Jesus people, these <laughs> surfers going along the beach as what is Latter-day monks. All of a sudden, we're starting to get a, a, a new paradigm for how we understand uh, this life together, this radical religious life of pure devotion uh, to yeah. Christ. Thank you. The Tory Honors Institute at Biola University. Biblically centered, great books, liberal education. More at biola.edu slash Tory.